Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Dr. Jennifer Nelson and I'm guest hosting for Diane this week. She will be back in the host seat next week. Um, I am a horticulturalist and I write a gardening blog at groundedandgrowing.co and tonight we have a great panel of experts here ready to answer your questions. So let's start with um, introduce our panel here. Tonight we have Kent and he's got a little bit to tell you about himself and sure. his email that he's got to answer. Thanks Jennifer. Uh, my name is Kent Miles. Uh, I'm a cut flower grower. Our company is Illinois Willows and we're located in western Champaign County. Um, I can answer questions on cut flowers, uh, grasses, perennials, annuals. Uh, we received a question uh, back in April, an email, uh, with regards to dahlias. And I brought some dahlias here on the table. You can take a look at those. Uh, the question is, um, I planted dahlia bulbs and then removed the bulbs after the foliage died. It was suggested on the package that the bulbs be put in a box in sawdust and store them in my garage. The following spring, they were dried up and shrunk. I like to try growing them again. Should I have left them in the ground like the rest of my bulbs or what? We've been growing dahlias for about eight years now and um, we lift our dahlias in the fall. We generally will wait until we get a killing frost and then try to get them out of the ground uh, within a week or two. Uh, it kind of depends on the autumn. If we get a lot of rain after we get a frost, um, it can be a little bit of a muddy job. Um, but generally, dahlias will not overwinter in our zone. Uh, they'll, they'll end up being mush in the springtime. Um, so in storing them, uh, what we do, uh, we put them in a mesh bag, the uh, tubers after they've been cleaned, and then we will put the mesh bags in, um, we have bulb crates, and then in that bulb crate we'll put in uh, pine shavings. And basically, um, you want air to get to the bulbs, to the tubers, but uh, you don't want um, them to dry out. I think evidently in the garage they might have dried out. Um, if it was an unheated garage, they might have froze. So um, I would go ahead and try them again, but uh, do a little more uh, research on storing them over the winter. Great, thanks Kent. Mm -hmm. Marianne, you've got some uh, show and tell there that I'm pretty jealous of. Yes, I do. I'm Marianne Metz. I'm a horticulturalist and landscape designer and currently employed with um, Prairie Gardens in Champaign. And I love talking about perennials, um, trees and shrubs, all sorts of growing things. That's uh, because I'm a gardener also. But what I have for you this evening is um, I was looking at what was in bloom um, in my garden and the gardens that I was out and about uh, seeing today. and. Coneflowers, I, I just can't believe how beautiful they are, but they're typically called purple coneflowers, uh, uh, some indigenous to the Midwest, um, echinaceas. But the ones in the market today are so varied in color and shape and form. It's, it's an absolutely rainbow selection uh, from oranges and yellows and reds and whites. And one of the uh, new trends is to have the green centers. And I particularly like this uh, really nice orange one with a green center called um, Cheesier. Is that what I told you, yeah, Kent? Cheese, yeah. 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 I think that's just incredible, beautiful plant. Uh, double form flowers that do not have the typical cone in the center. Um, the whites and the oranges, they're just beautiful. Beautiful array of color that you can get from one, just one genus of plants. Great, thanks Marianne. Uh, Dyke, you have an email to share with us? Yeah, my name's Dyke Barkley, <coughs> and I, uh, I'm running my own place, uh, Barkley Farms Nurseries down in Paris, and as well as I'm a horticulture instructor at Lakeland College. Um, kind of specialize as a plant geek, but mostly perennials and ornamental grasses. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a question here on coral bells, and um, it's kind of a long question, but basically it, it's talking about coral bells, and they've tried several different kinds over, over the years, and um, they, they grow lots of other plants, and they've got, they're doing well, but these coral bells are not. And they want to know what they need to do different, and they were kind of talking about, are they winter hardy here? They thought they were listed as zone four, and we should be fine. One of the problems you're going to run into with coral bells is the, the market's done a lot of breeding. 
Uh, they've mixed a lot of different species together. When you see zone four, you're generally talking about the old fashioned coral bell, Hookera sanguinea. But now we've mixed in Velosas and Macranthas and Americanas, and we get all these fancy colors. But a lot of them have just gotten to be almost too wimpy in my mind. Uh, so I, it's not winter hardiness. Coral bells do not have a big, heavy plant or not definitely a very small, lightweight root system. So a lot of times it's not, and cold hardiness strictly is based on how cold our winters get. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you're talking about frost heaving, either it gets pushed up out of the ground in the winter, or it actually rots in the early spring when we have wet, uh, probably having more trouble with the up and the down weather than we do the raw 20 below zero. So that's where hardiness the zone isn't gonna help you. And I, I think my first whole suggestion is find out which ones a local growers talk. Talk to somebody like, I mean, I, there are a lot of coral bells on the market that I wouldn't even take if you gave me. We tried a lot <laughs> of them in the yard. I mean, I like the Autumn Bride, Hooker Velosa Autumn Bride. I like uh, uh, Caramel, you know, the old fashioned uh, Palace Purple is really old, but if you're looking for a tough and walk away. So I think you're gonna have to do a little research, not necessarily look up what the cold hardiness is, find out what somebody's had good luck with because coral bells can be really tricky. They're not gonna put roots down looking for water. They're, they're just some things mm -hmm. can happen to them and they need really good growing conditions. So that may be why you're losing them and not others. Good points, Dyke. I've also had trouble just with the same variety will do well on one side of my house yeah. and not on the other. So it might take some experimenting exactly. in your own yard. Um, I brought a show and tell today and I, I intended to bring a large bowl overflowing with blackberries, but my family beat me to them. They didn't get the memo <laughs> that I wanted them for the show. Uh, but this, these are my triple crown blackberries and they're usually pretty big. Nice. Um, I wanted to show, this has a, one has just one druplet. The individual segments are called druplets that's white. I had my first picking earlier this week had several berries that were just white on one side and that's a sign that they've gotten sun scalded and it's totally normal and it happens this, especially when we have the hot weather. It doesn't mean that you can't eat them. Uh, make a cobbler, no one will notice. <laughs> um, but this is the time of year, and if it would be two days from now, I would have a giant bowl of these, because of course there was a ton just not quite ready. But these are not quite ready. They're not quite totally black. They're gonna be a little on the sour side. But keep your eyes open at the markets. They're gonna be showing up pretty soon here. Uh, we're going to go to the phone lines now, and we've got a call on line two from Beverly in Springfield. She has a question on a, on a green, light green plant. Yes, um, it's, it's a, an, an oval, oval shaped um, plant and it's a very light, light green, kind of maybe greenish gray. And um, it, it's starting to part in, in different areas and some of the foliage, foliage is beginning to, to stick up into the air. And I'm sorry, I don't know what the name of this plant is. I, I wish I knew to make it easier for you, but it's, it's, it's a really soft, soft to the touch uh, that plant. Was, okay, that was yeah. going to be my question, if it had soft, fuzzy leaves, because it sounds yeah. like lamb's ear to me. Somewhat. Mm -hmm. and, and this is an outside plant in, the, in your garden, correct? Pardon me? It's outside in the ground, in the garden? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Is it trying and to flower at all? Is, I, I don't know if, if, if this flowers or not so but um it's just starting to part in some areas and uh, like open up mm -hmm. you know and then there's some of the foliage that's starting to stick up some so i'm wondering if it might might be in its last days or maybe it's too hot for it or it may I be don't. starting to yeah. flower 
knows. Got enough to go on. Yeah, yeah know. Hard, not knowing what kind yeah. of plant it is makes it pretty difficult, don't you think? Yeah, and, it does. But uh, there are a number of plants I know in my garden that um, when they get to a certain height and they begin to flower, it, it they just kind of lay apart. And that's when you have to think about using something for a support, whether you're using sure. a metal support around it. I don't think it's, again, not knowing what it, what kind of plant it is, um, it, it may not be dying. It may just need support around it to, to right. hold up heavy leaves and, and heavy flower buds. It might be something that next year um, you can get different supports where the plant can grow yes. right mm -hmm. through it, and then you exactly. won't have this parting problem next year. But this would be a good year to take some notes and see what it actually does because maybe it's trying to flower. Um, hopefully we gave you a little bit to go on. Thanks for your question. We're going to go on to line five. Carol from Taylorville has a question about Joe Pie blooms. Yes, the plants are very beautiful, but they're starting to, the blooms are starting to dry up. So is this something that uh, you should just leave alone or should they be deadheaded? Eupatoriums don't necessarily need to be deadheaded. Uh, I I would because I like the, the tidiness of mm -hmm. deadheading myself. But I I don't know. Do birds eat, eat any of the parts of a? Eupatorium? I've just seen yeah. butterflies on ours. Butterflies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just see butterflies on I'm ours. Not, I, we've never really deadheaded ours. So you, you're thinking deadheaded to try and get it to rebloom more. Well, I'm not sure that would happen, but okay. the blooms, which were, you know, so lavish just a week or so right. ago, mm -hmm. are really looking sad and faded. Yeah, yeah I think it's it's going to be more personal preference yeah. whether you uh, like yeah, it totally. or not. I don't mind mm -hmm. it. We don't, I mean, I've got enough other things in the yard maybe to look at, right. but um, I think it's, I, the plant isn't going to care whether you remove the blooms or not. So, Probably not. So first thing to chuck off it, the plant isn't going to care one way or the other. So it's going to be preference on what it looks like, I think, sure. is what yeah. I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think it'll matter one way or the other. Just mm -hmm. decide what you'd rather look at. Oh. In your gardens. Okay, thank you. We're going to go on to line three. Bill from Robertsville, he has a question on his hibiscus plant. Go ahead, Bill. Hey, hello. Hi. What, what are you asking me? Uh, did you call us with a question on your hibiscus? Well, yes. I'm... Uh, Concerned, uh, we've had it for three years, and uh, other years it's just bloomed beautifully and everything by this time. And this year it just isn't doing well, and and I don't have any idea what's wrong. I thought that uh, we put it in the house during the winter time and take care of it. And this year, uh, well, I did prune it in February a little bit. It was getting so large we had to do something, but but it started. It is budding quite well now and blooming some, but it just it's very very. Well, not up to par, and I don't understand exactly how much I should fertilize it and so forth. Do you have any idea on that? Okay, so this is a tropical mm -hmm. hibiscus. Yeah. Okay, not a hardy. Okay. No. It's the type that doesn't, uh, uh, I don't know, it, it, uh, you can't let it freeze. Let's put it, right. That's all right. I know. Right, right, right. Yep. It's, uh, it's good sized. It's, uh, oh, it's about probably six foot tall now. Oh, wow. <laughs> is it root? But it, it consists of about four smaller saplings all wrapped okay. together. Sure. How big is the pot? How, how, is it root bound? Pardon me? How big is the container? The container? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's in about a, a oh, two and a half or three gallon pot. Six feet tall, tall, it's probably it's root bound. Root bound. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Pardon me? It's probably root bound if it's that big of a plant and that small of a pot. Yeah. I, th I think you're probably right on and that. And that's probably why it's just slow. I, but it, it's growing a lot, but it just isn't blooming right and so mm -hmm. forth. Yeah, it's well, probably a little under stress. Mm -hmm. but. One, one of the keys to getting tropicals to bloom profusely for you during the summer is, is fertilization. Mm -hmm. Fertilizing at least once a week, at least once a week, sometimes more often, because the, all the nutrients are just washed right, right out every time you, every time it rains or you water. So, um, yeah, to get, get them to bloom a little more, you need to fertilize a little more. Now, if he fertilizes too much, will it throw the blooms off that he's got? I haven't, uh, I haven't noticed that happening. Okay. okay. And, and I tell you something you may try next year is in the early spring when, when it's like you were talking about pruning in February, mm -hmm actually pull it out of the pot and shave. If you're gonna try and keep it in the same size pot, mm -hmm. shave some of that root yeah. ball away. Take two or three inches off the bottom, take some off the side, and that's pruning the roots as well as the top, and you'll get some fresh soil, and that will rejuvenate your plant. Totally. And, and so we do that at almost all our big show plants that we keep in the garden. We 
we shave them all that February, March, or somewhere in there, but when yeah. we got some time. and I've done that, and that helps yeah. a great deal. You feel like you're really tearing things up, but if it's, if it's a good, healthy plant and it's time to you know to take off and grow, it'll go. Okay. You don't want to do it in the, the dormant season. but no. Great, great answers. Okay, we're going to go to a very special video we have tonight on, can you believe it's been 25 years of Mid-American Gardener? Oh, I'm sorry. We don't have the video. Uh, we're going to just keep taking a couple more phone calls here. Uh, Jerry has a question on tomatoes. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Uh, this is the first year I've grown my tomato plants in a raised bed, and the foliage is just taking off like crazy. Yeah. Like, I think it might be too big, like 40 inches tall and probably 40 inches in diameter. Do I need to pinch those leaves back, and how do you do that? It's a, um, tomatoes love raised beds yeah, and containers. They, they like yeah. that loose, friable soil. Mm -hmm. That's really a great place to grow your tomatoes. I think that's a lot of fun, too. I, I don't know. I, you can certainly prune tomatoes, but I think choosing the right tomato to begin with, you can get determinate and indeterminates, mm -hmm. and they'll certainly determinants will control the, the height that they are, but pruning certainly, sure. Yeah, I, I think mainly what you have to worry about is I made a mistake last year in mine where I had all these plants I didn't want to throw away, so I thought I'd put them all in the garden. <laughs> and then they, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing yeah. that ever, yeah. I say that, but then they exploded and they got really big and they were almost touching so much that all the diseases moved in. Oh, so sure. it wasn't the fact that my plants were huge, it's the fact that I had huge plants next to each other and then I ended up with nothing but a mess. So. I, whether you prune or not may have more to do with you need airflow into your sure. plants more than your pruning because your plant gets so big. Some some tomatoes are big anyway. Right. But. You don't want to get over pruning to over pruning and you'll end up removing so much foliage that you'll yeah. start to get sun scald on exactly. the fruit. So I, I think the indeterminates though get so tall. I, I've had people tell me they have six foot tall tomatoes. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. sure, of course you can. They're they're vines. Right. And and they don't want them growing out and over the tomato cages mm -hmm. or whatever their support system is. So yeah, pruning at the top, oh but yeah, getting the airflow going your, that's what I them out inside I absolutely mm -hmm. okay uh, we're gonna go through another round of our emails and show and tells and Kent what okay. did you have uh, we got an email from Elaine uh, this past June and uh, it's on cutting flowers and uh, Elaine says that uh, she loves our show Mid American Gardener and she watches it every week uh, it is very informative and helpful. I have a question. My tulips, daffodils, and hyacinths have all bloomed. When can I cut down the green leaves and stems? Do I wait until it weathers and turns yellow? Hope you can help me. Uh, I would probably recommend that you let the spring bulbs uh, foliage go ahead and die back naturally. A lot of times on your daffodils, you can gather up the, the foliage and then tie it. Uh, keeps a little bit tidier than flopping mm -hmm. flat on the ground. Uh, the tulips and the hyacinths, um, you really don't need to do anything with those, but you want to keep them uh, still on the bulb, on the plant. Uh, you don't want to mow them down or cut them all the way down to the ground because all that energy goes back into the bulb for next year's bloom. Um, so I would just, you know, try to just tidy it up the area where you have your spring bulbs and um, you know, hopefully maybe put in some annuals to kind of cover mm -hmm. up that midsummer sure. why they're kind of, you know, going down. But hmm. well, thanks, Kent. Yep. Marianne, what question did you have? Well, my question this evening is about a tree, uh, bald cypress. Will grinding down cypress knees hurt the tree? I want to put in a concrete patio, but have some cypress knees in the area where it is going. Can I grind them down and pour con concrete over them without hurting the tree? Well, I think one of the first things that I'd like to say about um, the knees of bald cypress is that there's a lot of, um, not controversy, but we're, uh, people actually don't really know what the knees are for. They're part of the root system, certainly. Um, it, it just seems obvious that it, it's probably that they're um, looking for or trying to find air because they usually come when there's really wet conditions, like, like in the swamps in the south. So um, that's not actually what has been found to be so. There are uh, theories that the knees are for uh, support, 
to uh, keep the, the tree more steady in, in those kinds of wet, saturated situations. So it's, it's hard to know what they're really mm -hmm. for. Um, grinding them down maybe isn't the very best choice. Uh, maybe sawing them off and then gradually uh, grinding them down. Uh, pouring concrete over them, they're part of the root system. So yeah, you will be cutting off part of their air supply. Um, so it's, it's going to be a, a real struggle for the tree when you do pour concrete over it. And I, I would be very concerned about doing that and cutting off its air supply. And uh, th the notion that the knees could grow anyway mm -hmm. um, uh, close to the patio and maybe crack your concrete. So mm -hmm. there are a lot, there's several reasons that I would not suggest that you do it, but I don't think it'll hurt the tree. Okay. To grind them. Okay, thanks, Marianne. Doug, what did you have? Yeah, I had a question here. I want to know if we can ID a weed, and I'm doing a little guessing, trying to uh, ID from little pictures. But uh, they've got a garden uh, that it looks sounds like this weed's kind of taken over, and I kind of think, looking at it, um, it may be Artemisia vulgaris, otherwise known as mugwort. Kind of looks like a, a mum like. Well, that picture's bigger than what I saw. Um, <laughs> <laughs> little, uh, more like almost like mum like foliage, um, a little bit of a scent to it, like you would see, that's the seed head. Um, want to know what to do, and I think that, I mean, whether I id it correctly or not, it sends these real thin roots right between the mulch and the, and the soil, and all it takes is a little piece of uh, root to take off and take over, and what would, what would I do in my yard? I don't know if I'd have, we were laughing at the beginning, nuke it. Um, <laughs> I, you've got to get it under control one way or the other. I have a different grass taking a bed over, and I think I'm going to have to give up take out the good plants or just sacrifice them and, and get the weeds under control, whether I use Roundup and spend a full year or a full growing season, something to get it under control. If you can keep the plant growing for a full year, then it's probably, you know, those roots aren't going to be able to survive a full year down there. Uh, I, I saw where somebody else was laying tons of cardboard over it and just smothering it for a long period of time. So. I don't know of any easy answer. It, it's not an easy process. You've got to get it under control, whether you have to sacrifice that area and then come back. I'll say I can, I can attest to that. I brought Artemisia into our garden on purpose, not knowing its vigorous tendencies, yeah. and I regret it, I regret it immensely. <laughs> um, I've got a, a question from a viewer on tomatoes. Uh, she has um, tomatoes in some 20-gallon pots, and the mix is half topsoil and half all-purpose growing mix, standard growing mix, and she's got a little bit of leaf curl. Um, her soil test kit that she's done at home shows a, a large amount of nitrogen and then phosphorus and potassium are high as well. Um, the blossoms are dropping off and she wants to know if flushing it, because she's assuming she's over fertilized, is there anything else she can do? And well, the, the date on this email is from mid-month, and so we've had some really hot weather. Hot weather can cause tomatoes to drop their blossoms, especially if we stay in the 70s overnight and then we're going up into the high 80s and 90s during the day. Uh, she may have still have the high nitrogen problem, so I would say go ahead and keep uh, flushing it. And that should that's all you can really do and hope for some more moderate weather so hopefully they can recover. But a nice 20 gallon container for a tomato, it will be a very happy tomato indeed. And I think we have time for maybe one, one quick question, one quick question or two. Line three, Helene from Effingham has a question on surprise lilies. Hello. Hi, Helene, do you have a question for us? Yes, I, last year I had 12 or more surprise lilies. This year, I don't know what happened, I only got one. I, I didn't think anything killed those. I didn't <laughs> think so either. Yeah. I if thought I killed mine and they all came back. <laughs> I, the only thing I think of is you didn't, I mean, they, they're called surprise lilies because the bloom comes one time of year and the foliage comes another mm -hmm. time of the year. The only thing I could think of was be that the foliage was taken out. Maybe I, mowed or? Yeah, I think it was. It was nice. It looked nice. It looked like all my spring flowers and all this stuff. When they start dying, I weed whacked them off. And here they are, there's only one left, and it's so sad because I like them. They remind me of flamingos <laughs> standing in my garden. I wonder if she could, I wonder if you could dig and find out if the bulb's still there, if something, something moved. a varmint took your thought. bulb away, or, yeah. or I yeah. don't know. Yeah. They're tough plants, so yeah, I don't know they, what the, They are really yeah. tough. I, I've seen them bloom even without the foliage thing going on. I think Voles or moles, maybe? I, first thing you do is stick your, you know, Dig in the ground, see if you can find a plant. Yeah. 
And if the bulb's still there and not and, and died, then we got to back up. But I don't know. I check. I check in the soil to see if yeah, there's a bulb. I would dig bulb. around as well. Okay, uh, I think we have maybe a chance for one more question. Sherry from Rochester has a question on her hydrangea. I have several hydrangeas, and um, I started. Um, there, I think there's a type that bloom on old wood, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, um, when I first got it, it was it was quite lovely. I have beautiful foliage on it. Um, I might get one or two blossoms close to the ground, nothing on the ends of the branches. So it got so big, I went ahead and divided it, and I cut, um, now I have three hydrangeas all from the same rootstock, and I cut one way back, I let the other one go. Okay, we're going to, we're losing, they the still we're losing the blooms, we're probably not getting the right uh, flower buds and not overwintering, and I'm sorry we don't have enough time for, for that question tonight, but thank you for watching, and tune in next week.